Chapter 2 Dasin as an Actor Stages and Problems in the Development of the Fourth Political Theory Being a supporter of cyclical development and an opponent of Francis Bacon and his theory of knowledge, I would still like to suggest that we develop and modify approaches to specific topics and areas of thought in an ongoing manner. We have repeatedly clarified the notion of conservatism. We conducted a series of conferences and scientific symposia on the fourth political theory. Let us believe that these efforts, the results of which have been published in magazines, anthologies, monographies, and websites, were not carried out in vain, and that the reader is more or less familiar with them. Therefore, I propose to move on. I will demonstrate with concrete examples what has been done to promote the discussion of the fourth political theory and, consequently, the observable results of the activities conducted by the Center of Conservative Research at the Faculty of Sociology of Moscow State University and the St. Petersburg Conservative Club at the Faculty of Philosophy at St. Petersburg State University. This includes two books that were recently published in St. Petersburg by the wonderful St. Petersburg publishing house Amphora, Alain de Benoist, Against Liberalism, Towards the Fourth Political Theory, and my own, The Fourth Political Theory. The book by the philosopher Alain de Benoist, who spoke at St. Petersburg State University during the philosophy days there, is a compendium of his views on philosophy and political science pertaining to the major issues of our time, globalization, the economic and social crisis, the process of European integration, new political and social trends, the relationship between Europe and Russia, humanism, and so forth. All these problems are addressed from a critical standpoint towards the liberal ideology which dominates the world, the first and the most stable political theory. Lacking competition after the collapse of communism, it has become the primary target for criticism by those who are acutely aware of the negative impact of the status quo in politics, the social sphere, economics, culture, ideology, and so on, and who are searching for an alternative. The old alternatives to liberalism, communism, and fascism were overcome by history and discarded, each in its own way, and have demonstrated their ineffectiveness and incompetence. Therefore, the search for an alternative to liberalism must look elsewhere. The area to be searched is designated as the domain of the fourth political theory. Such an approach corresponds exactly to the state theme, conservatism, the future, or an alternative. If we think about an alternative and correlate it with the existing blueprint for the future, then we should clearly understand what the alternative is going to replace. The answer is simple, liberalism as the dominant global discourse. Therefore, the only significant alternative should logically be directed against liberalism, hence the title of Alain de Benoist's book. Nevertheless, the question remains, does conservatism fit this role? In part, we heard the answer in Benoist's speech, in which he criticized the liberal theory of progress. This philosophical approach proposes that conservatism is the most logical candidate for an alternative to liberalism, either as a relativizing worldview or as one which rejects progress altogether. What remains, then, is to specify the kind of conservatism in question. It is obvious that liberal conservatism cannot be considered an alternative to liberalism, being its variant. Thus, by the process of elimination, we can make a proposition. We must look for an alternative to liberalism in non-liberal versions of conservatism. All this is logical, since Benoist himself is known as a philosopher with conservative views. He is sometimes referred to as one of the pioneers of the European quote-unquote new right. But the particular kind of conservatism he has in mind is obvious from his newly published book. There is another aspect worth mentioning in regard to the title of Benoist's book. Many readers will remember another ideological manifesto directed against liberalism called After Liberalism by Emanuel Wellerstein. Despite the similarities in their titles and the object of criticism, there is a significant difference. Wallerstein criticizes liberalism from the point of view of the left, from the neo-Marxist position. And, like any Marxist, he sees liberalism, bourgeoisie, democracy, and capitalism, as a phase of historical development, which is progressive in comparison with the preceding phases of development, such as feudalism or slavery, but is inferior to what must come after it, socialism, communism, and so forth. We are talking about criticism from the left, and, in some ways, from the standpoint of the future, which is expressed in Wallerstein's book title, 
after liberalism. This is a typical feature of Marxism. For Benoist, neither the superiority of liberalism over earlier types of societies nor the advantages of the communist future are obvious. Therefore, despite the similarities of titles, there is a fundamental difference between the author's initial positions. With Wallerstein, we are dealing with criticism from the left. With Benoist, with criticism from the right. Another difference involves the relationship to liberalism. According to Wallerstein, the end of liberalism is a foregone conclusion, according to the very logic of socio-political and socio-economic history. And so he easily spoke of an after. For Benoist, the question remains. One must fight against liberalism, yet in this morally and historically justified struggle, there are no guaranteed results. It is important to fight against liberalism here and now. It is important to identify its vulnerabilities. It is important to forge an alternative worldview. But the future is in our hands, and it is open rather than predetermined. Wallerstein, in varying degrees, views things mechanistically, like any Marxist, whereas Benoist is an organicist and holist, like any real conservative. The last item I would like to point out in regards to the ideas of Alain de Benoist and their relevance is the understanding of Carl Schmitt's concept of the fourth nomos of the earth. That is, the relationship between political science and political theology, with geopolitics and the new model of the political organization of space. For my part, in the book Fourth Political Theory, I reviewed the three primary political theories of the past, liberalism, Marxism, which is socialism, and fascism, including national socialism, summed up their overall balance, and attempted to identify the horizons for the development of the fourth political theory beyond all three ideologies. This, of course, is extremely far from any dogmatism or proposal for a complete answer to the stated problem. Nevertheless, these are rather specific steps towards the preparation for tackling this issue. Without repeating what has already been said by my book and the book by Alain de Benoist, I will try to make a number of remarks about the development of this subject. What the fourth political theory is, in terms of what it opposes, is now clear. It is neither fascism, nor communism, nor liberalism. In principle, this kind of negation is rather significant. It embodies our determination to go beyond the usual ideological and political paradigms and to make an effort to overcome the inertia of the cliches within political thinking. This alone is a highly stimulating invitation for the free spirit and critical mind. I do not really understand why certain people, when confronted with the concepts of the fourth political theory, do not immediately rush to open a bottle of champagne and do not start dancing and rejoicing celebrating the discovery of new possibilities. After all, this is a kind of philosophical new year, an exciting leap into the unknown. The, quote, old year witnessed the struggle of the three political ideologies, one of which was so bloody that it claimed millions of lives. All the criticism of liberalism was either fascist or communist. These critical approaches have been left behind. But the oldest of these ideologies, liberalism, is still here. Liberalism is the remnant of the old year, it is residuo, an uncertain past that was not properly sent to oblivion. It has already passed, but does not want to leave permanently in any way. In short, it is a chimera, the dragon that swallowed the sun, or the evil spirits that kidnapped the snow maiden before the new year. In a sense, liberalism embodies everything that was in the past. The fourth political theory is the name for a breakthrough and a new beginning. Underscoring the relevance of this criticism, and especially highlighting the fact that this is a radical rejection of all three political theories, liberalism, communism, and fascism, and their variants, I suggest we meditate on the positive aspects of the fourth political theory. The fact that we have identified what we oppose is, in itself, a significant achievement and requires a thorough understanding. The very idea of putting an end to fascism, communism, and liberalism is an extremely liberating thing. The fourth political theory proclaims, say no to fascism, no to communism, and no to liberalism. Liberalism will not work. It will not pass. No passaron, much like fascism once failed. No ha passado, the Berlin Wall, too, collapsed. Only dust remains from the only visible barrier put up by communists to separate themselves from the liberal capitalists. The communists did not pass either. What remains is not for liberals to pass, and they will not pass. But in order for them not to pass, the fragments of the Berlin Wall are insufficient for us, 
as the wall itself was insufficient. The wall existed, but they still passed. Even less helpful are the dark shadows of the Third Reich. It's Nazelizni, inspiring only the brutal punk youth and the perverted dreams of sadomasochists. Consequently, we suggest moving beyond the nihilistic phase of the fourth political theory towards something constructive, once the three political theories, as a systematized whole, have been discarded. We can try to look at them from a different perspective. They are being rejected precisely as complete ideological systems, each on the basis of separate arguments. Like any system, they consist of elements that do not belong to them. The three political ideologies own their own unique philosophical systems, groups, explanatory methodologies, and represent a whole, which is a structure derived from their hermeneutic circle and their fundamental beliefs. They are what they are as a whole, dismembered into components. They lose their significance and become meaningless. Liberalism, Marxism, socialist or communist, and fascism, including national socialism, are not components of overarching liberal, Marxist, or fascist ideologies. It is not that they are completely neutral, but outside of their strict ideological context, one can find or discover a different or new meaning for them. The positive aspects of the development of the fourth political theory are based on this principle, a revision of the three political ideologies, and an analysis of each in unconventional ways can give certain clues to the substantive content of our own theory. In each of the three ideologies, there is a clearly defined historical subject. In liberal ideology, the historical subject is the individual. The individual is conceived as a unit that is rational and endowed with a will, morality. The individual is both a given and the goal of liberalism. It is a given, but one that is often unaware of its identity as an individual. All forms of collective identity, ethnic, national, religious, caste, and so on, impede an individual's awareness of his individuality. Liberalism encourages the individual to become himself, that is, to be free of all those social identities and dependencies that constrain and define the individual from outside. This is the meaning of liberalism. In English, liberty. In Latin, libertas. The call to become liberated. Latin, liber. From all things external to oneself. Moreover, liberal theorists, in particular John Stuart Mill, underscore the fact that we are talking about a freedom from, about the release from ties, identifications, and restrictions that are an imposition upon the individual's will. As for what the purpose of this freedom is, liberals remain silent to assert some kind of a normative goal is, in their eyes, to restrict the individual and his freedom. Therefore, they strictly separate a freedom from, which they regard as a moral imperative of social development, from the freedom for, the normativization of how, why, and for what purpose this freedom should be used. The latter remains at the discretion of the historical subject, in other words, the individual. The historical subject of the second political theory is class. The class structure of society and the conflict between the exploiter and the exploited classes are the core of the communist's dramatic vision of history. History is class struggle. Politics is its expression. The proletariat is a dialectic historical subject, which is called to set itself free from the domination of the bourgeoisie and to build a society on new foundations. A single individual is conceived here as a part of a class-based whole and acquires social existence only in the process of raising class consciousness. And finally, the subject of the third political theory is either the state, as in Italian fascism, or race, as in German National Socialism. In fascism, everything is based upon a right-wing version of Hegelianism. Since Hegel himself considered the Prussian state to be the peak of historical development in which the subjective spirit was perfected, Giovanni Gentile, a proponent of Hegelianism, applied this concept to fascist Italy. In German National Socialism, the historical subject is the Aryan race, which, according to racists, carries out the eternal struggle against the subhuman races. The appalling consequences of this ideology are too well known to dwell upon here. However, it was this original definition of a historical subject that was at the heart of the Nazis' criminal practices. The definition of a historical subject is the fundamental basis for political ideology in general, and defines its structure. Therefore, in this matter, the fourth political theory may act in the most radical way by rejecting all of these constructions as candidates for a historical subject. The historical subject is neither an individual, nor class, nor state, nor race. 
This is the anthropological and historical axiom of the fourth political theory. We assume that it is clear to us who or what cannot be the historical subject, but then who or what can. We cleared a space and correctly posed the question. We specified the problem of clarifying the historical subject in the fourth political theory. Now there is a gaping void, which is extremely interesting and significant. Heading into the depths of this void, we propose four hypotheses, which are not mutually exclusive, and which can be examined both collectively and individually. The first hypothesis suggests abandoning all types of contenders for the role of historical subjects from classical political theory, assuming that the subject of the fourth political theory is some type of compound, not the individual, class, state, race, or nation on their own, but instead a certain combination thereof. This is the hypothesis of a compound subject. The second hypothesis is to approach the problem from the standpoint of phenomenology. Let us place all that we know about the historical subject outside the framework of classical ideologies, carry out the Husserlian method of epoch, and try to empirically define that life world which will open up before us, the life world of the political, one free from metaphysics or theology. Is it possible to consider political history without a subject? History is such? After all, Theoretically, there were historical periods when politics existed, but when there was no subject in the philosophical, Cartesian sense. Of course, in hindsight, even this pre-subject in political history was reinterpreted in accordance with various ideologies. But if we no longer trust ideologies, such as the three political theories, then their historical reconstruction is not an axiom for us. If we consider political history in the style of the Annales school, Fernand Braudel's method, then we have the chance to discover a rather polyphonic picture, expanding our understanding of the subject. In the spirit of Peter Berger, we can open up the prospect of de-secularization throughout history, religious organizations frequently act as political subjects, or together with Carl Schmitt, we can rethink the influence of tradition on a political decision. In the spirit of Schmitt's doctrine of decisionism, Discarding the dogma of progress will reveal a wide range of political actors operating up until and beyond the New Age, which fits into the conservative approach. But we are free to continue our open search for what may replace the historical subject in the future, perhaps in the exotic hypothesis of Deleuze and Guattari about the rhizome, a body without organs, micropolitics, and so on, or on the horizon of proto-history with the Baudrillard and Derrida text deconstruction, difference, etc. They offer us new, and this time not entirely conservative, capabilities. Therefore, it is not worthwhile to reject them in advance, simply on the basis of their authors' sympathies towards Marxism and their leftist affiliation. The third hypothesis is about forcing the phenomenological method and rushing several steps ahead. We may propose to consider Heidegger's Dasein as the subject of the fourth political theory. Dasein is described in Heidegger's philosophy at length through its existential structure, which makes it possible to build a complex, holistic model based on it, the development of which will lead to, for instance, a new understanding of politics. Many researchers have lost sight of the fact that Heidegger, especially in his middle period between 1936 and 1945, developed a complete history of philosophy centered around Dasein, which it has become apparent in retrospect, can form the basis of a full-fledged and well-developed political philosophy. Thus, accepting the Dasein hypothesis immediately gives us a broad map in order to navigate the construction of history necessary for political theory. If the subject is Dasein, then the fourth political theory would constitute a fundamental ontological structure that is developed on the basis of existential anthropology. We can map out the direction to describe this type of an approach. Dasein and the state. Dasein and social stratification. Dasein and power, the will to power, being and politics, the horizons of political temporality, existential spatiality, and the phenomenology of boundaries, the prince and nothing, parliament, the choice, and being towards death, citizenship and the role of the guardians of being, referendum and intentionality, the authentic and the inauthentic in jurisprudence, existential philosophy of jurisprudence, Revolution and the flight of the gods. Urbanization and the house of being. Naturally, this is merely a cursory outline of the areas of interest for the new political science. 
The fourth hypothesis appeals to the concept of the imagination, el imaginaire. This topic is covered in detail in the works of Gilbert Durand, the basic ideas of which are discussed in my new work, Sociology of the Imagination. Imagination as a structure precedes the individual, the collective, class, culture, and race, if race exists as a sociological phenomenon, which is uncertain, as well as the state. According to Durand, who developed the ideas of Carl Gustav Jung and Gaston Bachelard, the imagination forms the content of human existence based on the internal, original, and independent structures that are embedded in it. The interpretation of political processes in history, a posteriori, is of no difficulty for the sociology of the imagination, and it produces impressive results. If we interpret the imagination as an autonomous actor in the political sphere, including its ability to project and grant it a sort of legal status, then we end up with an extraordinarily fascinating and totally undeveloped trajectory. Though the students of 1968 demanded freedom for the imagination, in that moment they were unlikely to recognize the imagination as a contender for special political subjectivity. They remained trapped in the individual as part of liberalism, even if, quote, of the left, and class, for example, Marxism, although strictly reconsidered on the basis of psychoanalysis. In the search for the subject of the fourth political theory, we must boldly enter into a new hermeneutic circle. The fourth political theory is the whole, which, naturally, has not yet been sufficiently described and defined. It is comprised of the ideas of its subject, which has been suggested in a preliminary fashion, but moving constantly between the uncertainty of the whole and the uncertainty of its parts and back again, we gradually begin to clarify more precisely what it takes and what is at stake. This process, starting from the standpoint of dismissing that which came before it, the rejection of the old hermeneutic circles, liberalism and the individual, Marxism and class, fascism slash Nazism and the state slash race, will lead to the development of a more constructive idea sooner or later. Its structure will be further clarified when its hermeneutics comes up against explicitly absurd contradictions which cannot be resolved or else stops corresponding to the real world. That is, after starting from a certain point, the development of the fourth political theory will begin to develop scientific and rational characteristics which, for the time being, are barely discernible behind the power of its groundbreaking intuitions and its revolutionary, Herculean task of overcoming the old ideologies. The entire hermeneutic circle of the fourth political theory should be included in the fourth nomos of the earth. This inclusion will specify its content in even more detail and, in particular, will reveal the colossal epistemological potential of geopolitics. The latter, in addition to its purely practical and applied objectives, can be viewed as a broad invitation to think spatially in a postmodern scenario when historical thinking which dominated the modern era, is becoming irrelevant. On numerous occasions I have written about the philosophical and the sociological potential of geopolitics in my works. Spatiality is one of the most important existential components of Dasin, so the appeal to the fourth nomos of the earth can be tied to the third subject hypothesis of the fourth political theory. Now we can approach the problem of creating the fourth political theory from another direction and examine the contenders for inclusion in this theory from the three classical models. However, before determining which aspects of the three old ideologies can be borrowed from them, having neutralized them and taken them out of context, ripping them out of their own hermeneutic circle, it is important to briefly mention which aspects must be firmly discarded. If we begin with fascism and national socialism, then here we must definitively reject all forms of racism. Racism is what caused the collapse of national socialism in the historical, geopolitical, and theoretical sense. This was not only a historical, but also a philosophical collapse. Racism is based on the belief in the innate objective superiority of one human race over another. It was racism, and not some other aspect of national socialism, that brought about such consequences leading to immeasurable suffering on both sides, as well as the collapse of Germany and the Axis powers, not to mention the destruction of the entire ideological project of the Third Way. The criminal practice of wiping out entire ethnic groups, Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs, based on race, was precisely rooted in their social theory. This is what angers and shocks us about Nazism today. In addition, 
Hitler's anti-Semitism, and the doctrine that Slavs are, quote, subhuman and must be colonized, is what led Germany to go to war against the Soviet Union, which cost us millions of lives. It is also true that this resulted in the Germans themselves losing their political freedom and the right to participate in political history for a long time, if not forever. Today, they are left only with their economy and with a concern for ecology. The supporters of the Third Way were left in the position of ideological outcasts on the margins of society. It was racism, in theory and in practice, that criminalized all other aspects of National Socialism and Fascism, causing these worldviews to become the object of curses and vilification. Hitler's racism, however, is only one form of racism. This type of racism is the most obvious, straightforward, and biological, and therefore the most repulsive. There are other forms of racism, cultural, asserting that there are high and low cultures, civilizational, dividing people into those civilized and those insufficiently civilized, technological, viewing technological development as the main criterion for the value of a society, social, stating, in the spirit of the Protestant doctrine of predestination, that the rich are the best and the greatest as compared to the poor, economic, in which all humanity is ranked according to the degree of material well-being, and evolutionary, for which it is axiomatic that human society is the result of biological development, in which the basic processes of the evolution of species, survival of the fittest, natural selection, and so on, continue today. European and American societies are fundamentally afflicted with these types of racism, unable to eradicate them from itself despite intensive efforts. Being fully aware of how revolting this phenomenon is, people in the West tend to make racism a taboo. However, all this turns into is a witch hunt. New pariahs accused of fascism are its victims, often for no apparent reason. Thus, this very political correctness and its norms are transformed into a totalitarian discipline of political, purely racist exclusions. In this manner, the institutionalized French left liberal anti-racism has gradually become the distribution center of racial hatred. Even Africans suffer from being accused of fascism. Such was the case of the unrestrained defamatory campaign against the well-known black comedian Deudane Bala Bala, who dared to mock certain hideous features of the contemporary French establishment in his routines, including anti-racism, Ross Le Front, SOS Racisme, etc. And then what? African comedian Bala Bala was categorized as brown, that is, accused of fascism and racism. The newest types of fascism and racism are glamour, fashion, and the latest trends in information technology. Its norms are set by models, designers, and socialites of political parties, and those who insist on owning only the latest models of mobile phones or laptop computers. Conformity or nonconformity with the glamour code is located at the very base of the mass strategies for social segregation and cultural apartheid. Today, this is not associated directly with the economic factor, but is gradually gaining independent sociological features. This is the ghost of the glamour dictatorship, the new generation of racism. The very ideology of progress is racist in its structure. The assertion that the present is better and more fulfilling than the past, and continual assurances that the future will be even better than the present, are discriminations against the past and the present, as well as the humiliation of all those who lived in the past, an insult to the honor and dignity of our ancestors and those of others, and a violation of the rights of the dead. In many cultures, the dead play an important sociological role. They are considered to still be alive, in a certain sense, present in this world and participating in its life. This is true of all ancient cultures and civilizations. Billions of inhabitants on this earth believe in this concept to this day. In Chinese civilization, which was built upon the cult of the dead and upon their reverence alongside the living, being dead is regarded as a high social status in some ways superior to the status of the living. The ideology of progress represents the moral genocide of past generations, in other words, real racism. Equally questionable is the idea of modernization when it is taken as a self-evident virtue. It is easy to detect the obvious signs of racism in it. Undoubtedly, racist is the idea of unipolar globalization. It is based on the idea that the history and values of Western and especially American society is equivalent to universal laws and artificially tries to construct a global society based on what are actually local and historically specific values, democracy, the market, 
parliamentarianism, capitalism, individualism, human rights, and unlimited technological development. These values are local ones emerging from the particular development of a single culture, and globalization is trying to impose them onto all of humanity as something that is universal and taken for granted. This attempt implicitly argues that the values of all other peoples and cultures are imperfect, underdeveloped, and should be subject to modernization and standardization in imitation of the Western model. Globalization is thus nothing more than a globally deployed model of Western European, or rather Anglo-Saxon, ethnocentrism, which is the purest manifestation of racist ideology. As one of its essential features, the fourth political theory rejects all forms and varieties of racism and all forms of normative hierarchization of societies based on ethnic, religious, social, technological, economic, or cultural grounds. Societies can be compared but we cannot state that any one of them is objectively better than the others. Such an assessment is always subjective, and any attempt to raise a subjective assessment to the status of a theory is racism. This type of an attempt is unscientific and inhumane. The differences between societies in any sense can, in no shape or form, imply the superiority of one over the other. This is a central axiom of the fourth political theory. Furthermore, if anti-racism directly opposes the ideology of National Socialism, in other words the third political theory, then it also indirectly attacks Communism, with its class hatred, as well as Liberalism, with its progressivism as well as its inherent form of economic, technological, and cultural racism. Instead of a unipolar world, the fourth political theory insists upon a multipolar world, and instead of universalism, on pluriversalism, which Alain de Benoist brilliantly pointed out in his book. Clearly highlighting the main trajectory for the rejection of all forms and varieties of racism, including the biological theories inherent in National Socialism, we can identify what the fourth political theory may borrow from it. Strongly rejecting any suggestion of racism, we, in fact, destroy the hermeneutic circle of National Socialist ideology and neutralize its content undermining its integrity and key foundations. Without racism, National Socialism is no longer National Socialism, either theoretically or practically, and becomes harmless and decontaminated. We can now proceed without fear to analyze it objectively in search of those ideas within it that could be integrated into the fourth political theory. We note a positive attitude towards the ethnos, an ethnocentrism directed towards that type of existence which is formed within the structure of the ethnos itself and which remains intact throughout a variety of stages, including the highly differentiated types of societies which a people may develop in the course of their history. This topic has found deep resonance in certain philosophical directions of the conservative revolution. For instance, Carl Schmitt and his theory of the, quote, rights of peoples, in Adam Mueller, Arthur Moeller van den Brut, and so on, or the German School of Ethnic Sociology, Wilhelm Mollmann, Richard Thurnwald, and others. Ethnos is the greatest value of the fourth political theory as a cultural phenomenon, as a community of language, religious belief, daily life, and the sharing of resources and goals, as an organic entity written into an accommodating landscape, Lev Gumilev, as a refined system for constructing models for married life, as an always unique means of establishing a relationship with the outside world, as the matrix of the quote, life world, Edmund Husserl, and as the source of all the language games, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Of course, ethnicity was not the focal point either in National Socialism or in Fascism. Yet, liberalism as an ideology, calling for the liberation from all forms of collective identity in general, is entirely incompatible with the ethnos and ethnocentrism, and is an expression of a systemic, theoretical, and technological ethnocide. Marxist ideology did not pay much attention to the ethnos either, believing that the ethnos is overcome in a class-based society and that no trace of it remains in a bourgeois and, even more so, a proletarian society. Based on the latter, the principle of proletarian internationalism becomes absolute. The only place where the ethnos received any kind of attention is in dissident, third-way currents, which were rather marginal in relation to the political mainstream, even though Nazi orthodoxy blocked the organic development of the ethno-sociological subject area with its racist dogma. Whatever the case may be, the ethnos and ethnocentrism, Wilhelm Molman, 
have every reason to be considered as candidates for becoming the subject of the fourth political theory. At the same time, we must again and again pay attention to the fact that we view the ethnos in the plural without trying to establish any kind of hierarchical system. Ethnicities are different, but each of them is in itself universal. Ethnicities live and develop, but this life and this development do not fit into one specific paradigm. They are open and always distinct. Ethnicities mix and separate, but neither one nor the other is good or evil per se. Ethnicities themselves generate the criteria by which others are judged, each time in a different way. We can draw many conclusions based on this point. In particular, we can relativize the very notion of politics, which comes from the normative values of the city, the polis, and consequently of the urban model of self-organization within the community or the society. As a general paradigm, we can review what Richard Thurnwald called Dorfstadt, a, quote, village state. The village state is an alternative view of politics from the perspective of the ethnos naturally living in balance with its environment. This view is not reflective of the city, projecting its structure onto the rest of the country, but is that of the village or the province. It comes from the standpoint of those regions that have been peripheral in classical politics, but which are the center of the fourth political theory. However, this is only one example of all the possibilities that open up if we accept the ethnos as the historical subject. Yet, even this shows the possibilities inherent in transforming even the most basic political concepts and how drastic the revision of an established dogma can be. Now let us discuss what could be taken from communism, the second political theory. First, however, let us decide on what should be discarded in order to demolish its hermeneutic circle. First and foremost, the communist theories regarding historical materialism and the notion of unidirectional progress are inapplicable to our purposes. We have previously talked about the racist element, which is embedded in the idea of progress. It looks particularly revolting within historical materialism, which not only prioritizes the future ahead of the past, brutally violating the, quote, rights of the ancestors, but also equates the living human society, Richard Thurnwald, with a mechanical system operating independently of humanity, according to laws that are monotonous and uniform for all. Materialist reductionism and economic determinism comprise the most repulsive aspect of Marxism, in practice, it was expressed through the destruction of the spiritual and religious heritage of those societies in which Marxism came to dominate. An arrogant contempt for the past, a vulgar materialistic interpretation of spiritual culture, a focus exclusively upon economic factors, a positive attitude towards the process of creating a social differential through the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, and the idea of class as the only historical subject. The fourth political theory rejects all these aspects of Marxism. However, without these components, Marxism, and more generally, socialism, ceases to be itself, and, consequently, it is rendered harmless as a full-fledged ideology, breaking into separate components that do not represent a single whole. Marxism is relevant in terms of its description of liberalism, in identifying the contradictions of capitalism, in its criticism of the bourgeois system, and in revealing the truth behind the bourgeois democratic policies of exploitation and enslavement which are presented as, quote, development and, quote, liberation. Marxism's critical potential is highly useful and applicable. It may well be included in the arsenal of the fourth political theory, but, if so, Marxism will not appear as an ideology that provides answers to a full range of emerging issues, answers that are rational and axiomatic in their foundation but as an expressive myth or a witty sociological method. The Marxism which we can accept is mythic, sociological Marxism. As a myth, Marxism tells us the story of the original state of paradise, quote, primitive communism, which was gradually lost, quote, the initial division of labor and the stratification of the primitive society. Then the contradictions grew, moving towards the point when, at the end of this world, they were reincarnated, in their most paradigmatically pure form, as the confrontation between labor and capital. Capital, the bourgeoisie and liberal democracy, personified global evil, exploitation, alienation, lies, and violence. Labor embodied a great dream and an ancient memory of the, quote, common good and its acquisition. The, quote, surplus value by an evil minority gave birth to all the problems of modern life. Labor, the proletariat, 
must recognize the paradoxes inherent in this state of affairs and rise up against their masters in order to build a new society, a new paradise on earth, communism. Only this will not be the naturally occurring primitive communism, but an artificial, scientific kind in which the differential, accumulated over centuries and millennia of alienation, will serve the quote commune, the community. In this way, the dream will become a reality. This myth fits neatly into the structure of eschatological consciousness, which occupies a significant place in the mythologies of all tribes and peoples, not to mention the highly differentiated religions. That alone speaks in its favor in order for us to treat it with the utmost consideration. On the other hand, as sociology, Marxism is tremendously useful in revealing those mechanisms of alienation and mystification that liberalism uses to justify its dominion, and as proof of its, quote, correctness. Being a myth itself, in its polemic, activist form, Marxism serves as an excellent tool to expose the bourgeois, quote, great stories in order to overthrow the credibility of the liberal pathos. And in this capacity, quote, against liberalism, it can be used effectively under the new conditions. After all, we continue to exist under capitalism, and hence, Marxist criticism of it and the struggle against it remain on the agenda even if the old forms of this struggle have become irrelevant. Marxism is often correct when it describes its enemy, especially the bourgeoisie. However, its own attempts to understand itself lead to failure. The first and the most prominent contradiction is Marx's unfulfilled prediction about the type of societies that are the most prone to socialist revolutions. He was confident that this would take place in the greatly industrialized countries of Western Europe, which had a very high level of manufacturing and contained a large proportion of urban proletariat. Such revolutions were considered impossible in agrarian countries, as well as those countries with an Asiatic mode of production, due to their supposed backwardness. In the 20th century, everything occurred exactly to the contrary. Socialist revolutions and socialist societies developed in agrarian countries which had a traditional rural population, while nothing similar occurred in any of the highly developed nations of Europe and America. However, even in those countries where socialism was victorious, Marxist dogma did not allow for a rethinking of its basic logical assumptions, such as to consider or reconsider the role of pre-industrial factors, or to honestly evaluate the real power of myth. In its Western and Soviet versions, Marxism's self-reflection turned out to be questionable and inaccurate. While justifiably criticizing liberalism, Marxism was seriously mistaken about itself, which, at some point, doomed its own fate. It eventually collapsed, even in those places where it had triumphed, and, in those areas where Marx had expected it to win, capitalism prevailed the proletariat dissolved into the middle class, and disappeared inside the consumer society, contrary to expectations and predictions. In the end, European revolutionary communists turned into petty bourgeois clowns entertaining the bored and jaded democratic public. If Marxism itself was unable to look at itself from a proper standpoint, then nothing prevents us from doing so in the context of the fourth political theory. Alain de Benoist has a classic book entitled Vue de Droit, A View from the Right, in which he suggests the rereading of various political writers, both from the right and the left, from the point of view of the New Right. This book led to the inception of the New Right movement in Europe. It contains not only a critique of those ideas which served as dogma for the old right, but also a revolutionary and well-meant reading of such authors as the communist Antonio Gramsci, examined from the point of view of the right. It is precisely this reading of Marx, from the right, from the standpoint of myths and from archaic and holistic sociology, that would be particularly fitting at the present time. Finally, what can we take from liberalism? And here, as always, we must begin with those aspects that must not be borrowed. Perhaps in this case, everything is described clearly and in a fairly detailed manner in Alain de Benoist's work against liberalism towards the fourth political theory, to which I keep constantly and consciously referring to in my explanations. Liberalism is the main enemy of the fourth political theory, which is being constructed specifically to be in total opposition to it. Yet, even here, 
as was the case with the other political theories, there is something important and something secondary. Liberalism as a whole rests on the individual as its most basic component. It is these individuals, collectively, but in isolation from one another, that are taken as the whole. It is, perhaps, for this reason that the hermeneutic circle of liberalism turned out to be the most durable. It has the smallest orbit and rotates around its subject, the individual. In order to shatter this circle, we must strike the individual, abolish him, and cast him into the periphery of political considerations. Liberalism is well aware of this danger, and therefore undertakes one battle after another with all other ideologies and theories, social, philosophical, and political, that encroach on the individual, inscribing his identity into a more general context. The neurosis and fears located at the pathogenic core of liberal philosophy are clearly seen in the open society and its enemies, a classic of neoliberalism by Karl Popper. He compared fascism and communism based precisely on the fact that both ideologies integrate the individual into a supra-individual community, into a whole, into a totality, which Popper immediately qualified as, quote, totalitarianism. Having undermined the individual as the constitutive figure of the entire political and social system, we can put an end to liberalism. Of course, this is not that easy to achieve. Nevertheless, it is now obvious that the weakest and the strongest aspect of the first political theory comes from its direct appeal to the individual, pleading that he remain himself, by himself, in his own autonomous individuality, uniqueness, particularity, and partiality. In any case, the fourth political theory can interpret Popper's phobias in its favor. This led him and his followers to anecdotal conclusions. Quite telling are his feeble-minded criticisms of Hegel in the spirit of a smear campaign and the accusations of fascism directed towards Plato and Aristotle. Understanding what the enemy fears the most, we propose the theory that every human identity is acceptable and justified, except for that of the individual. Man is anything but an individual. We must look carefully at a liberal when he reads or hears an axiom of this kind. I think this will be an impressive spectacle. All his, quote, tolerance will instantly evaporate. Quote, human rights will be distributed to anyone, just not the one who dares to utter something along these lines. This, however, I described in more detail in my essay, Maximal Humanism, as well as in my book, The Philosophy of Politics. Liberalism must be defeated and destroyed, and the individual must be thrown off his pedestal. Yet, is there anything we could take away from liberalism, from this liberalism that is hypothetically defeated and has lost its axis? Yes, there is. It is the idea of freedom. And not just the idea of freedom for, that same substantive freedom rejected by Mill, in his liberal program, which concentrated on the freedom from. We must say yes to freedom in all its meanings and in all its perspectives. The fourth political theory should be a theory of absolute freedom, but not as in Marxism, in which it coincides with absolute necessity. This correlation denies freedom at its very core. No, freedom can be of any kind, free of any correlation or lack thereof, facing any direction and any goal. Freedom is the greatest value of the fourth political theory, since it coincides with its center and its dynamic, energetic core. The difference is that this freedom is conceived as human freedom, not as freedom for the individual, as the freedom given by ethnocentrism, and the freedom of Dasin, the freedom of culture, and the freedom of society, and the freedom for any form of subjectivity except for that of an individual. Moving in the opposite direction, European thought long ago came to a different conclusion. Quote, man, as an individual, is a prison without walls. Jean-Paul Sartre, that is to say, the freedom of an individual is a prison. In order to attain true freedom, we must go beyond the limits of the individual. In this sense, the fourth political theory is a theory of liberation, of going beyond the prison walls into the outside world, which begins where the jurisdiction of individual identity ends. Freedom is always fraught with chaos, but is also open to opportunities, placed into the narrow framework of individuality. The amount of freedom becomes microscopic and, ultimately, fictitious. The individual is granted freedom because the uses to which he can put it are extremely limited. It will remain contained within the tiny scope of his individuality and that over which he has direct control. This is the flip side of liberalism. At its core, it is totalitarian and intolerant of differences, and most especially opposed to the realization of a great will. 
It is only prepared to tolerate small people. It protects not so much the rights of man, but rather the rights of a small man. This quote, small man can be allowed to do anything, but in spite of all his desire, he will be unable to do anything. Yet, beyond the small man, on the other side, of minimal humanism, one can just glimpse the closest horizon of genuine freedom. However, it is also there that great risk and serious danger emerge. Having left the limits of individuality, man can be crushed by the elements of life and by dangerous chaos. He may want to establish order, and this is entirely within his right, the right of a great man, Homo Maximus, a real man of, quote, being in time, Martin Heidegger, and, like any other, this possible order, the coming order, may be embodied in individual forms. Nonetheless, this is not individuality, but individuation. Not empty rotations around that which has been received from the liberal authorities and which is meaningless, but the actual execution of tasks, as well as the taming of the restless and exciting horizons of the will. The bearer of freedom in this case will be Dasin. The previous ideologies, each in its own way, alienated Dasin from its meaning, restricted it and imprisoned it in one way or another, making it inauthentic. Each of these ideologies put a cheerless doll, Das Man, in the place of Dasin. The freedom of Dasin lies in implementing the opportunities to be authentic, that is, in the realization of Sin, more so than of Da. Their being, quote-unquote, consists of their and of being. In order to understand where this there is located, we should point it out and make a basic foundational gesture. Yet, in order for, quote, being to flow into, quote, there, like a fountain, we must place all of this together, place this entire hermeneutic circle into the domain of complete freedom. Therefore, the fourth political theory is, at the same time, a fundamental ontological theory which contains the awareness of the truth of being at its core. Without freedom, we cannot force anyone to exist. Even if we build the optimal society, and even if we force everyone to act appropriately and to operate within the framework of the correct paradigm, we could never guarantee such an outcome. This results from a man's freedom to choose being. Of course, most often, man gravitates towards the, quote, inauthentic existence of Dasin, trying to dodge the issue, to succumb to gossip, and to self-mockery. Liberated Dasin may not choose the path to being, may hide in shelter, and may once again clutter the world with its hallucinations and fears, and its concerns and intentions. Choosing Dasin may corrupt the fourth political theory itself, turning it into a self-parody. This is a risk, but being is a risk too. The only question is who risks what. You risk everything, or everything and everyone puts you at risk. Yet, only that which increases freedom will make the choice of authentic being a reality. Only then will the stakes be truly great, when the danger is infinite. Unlike other political theories, the fourth political theory does not want to lie, soothe, or seduce. It summons us to live dangerously, to think riskily, to liberate, and to release all those things that cannot be driven back inside. The fourth political theory trusts the fate of being, and entrusts fate to being. Any strictly constructed ideology is always a simulacrum, and always inauthentic. That is to say, it always is the lack of freedom. Therefore, the fourth political theory must not hurry in order to become a set of basic axioms. Perhaps it is more important to leave some things unsaid, to be discovered in expectations and insinuations, in allegations and premonitions. The fourth political theory should be completely open. Chapter 3. The Critique of Monotonic Processes The idea of modernization is based on the idea of progress. When we use the term modernization, we certainly mean progress, linear accumulation, and a certain continuous process. We presuppose development, growth, and evolution. This is the same semantic system. Thus, when we speak of the unconditionally positive achievements of modernization, we agree with a very important basic paradigm. We agree with the idea that human society is developing, progressing, evolving, growing, and getting better and better. That is to say, we share a particular vision of historical optimism. This historical optimism pertains to the three classical political ideologies, liberalism, communism, and fascism. It is rooted in the scientific, societal, political, and social worldview in the humanities and natural sciences of the 18th and 19th centuries, 
when the idea of progress developed and growth was taken as an axiom that could not be doubted. In other words, this entire set of axioms, as well as the whole historiography and predictive analytics of the 19th century in the humanities and the natural sciences, was built on the idea of progress. We can easily trace the development of this subject, the idea of progress, in the three political ideologies. Let us turn to the classical liberalism of the sociologist Herbert Spencer. He claimed that the development of human society is the next stage of the evolution of the animal species, and that there is a connection and continuity between the animal world and social development, and, therefore, all the laws of the animal world leading to development, improvement, and evolution in the animal world within Darwin's framework can be projected onto society. This is the basis of the famous theory, social Darwinism, of which Spencer was a classic representative. If, according to Darwin, the driving force behind the evolution of the animal kingdom is the struggle for survival and natural selection, then the same process must take place in society, argued Spencer. And the more perfect this struggle is for survival, interspecies, intraspecies, the struggle of the strong against the weak, the competition for resources, pleasure, the more perfect our society becomes. The question is how to aid this process of selection. According to Spencer, this is the central theme of the liberal model and is the meaning of social progress. Therefore, if we are liberals in one way or another, we inherited this zoological approach to social development based on the struggle against the destruction of the weak by the strong. However, Spencer's theory contains one important point. He argued that there are two phases of social development, the first phase occurs when the struggle for survival is conducted crudely, by force. This is characteristic of the ancient world. The second occurs when the struggle is carried out more subtly through economic means. Once the bourgeois revolution takes place, the struggle for survival does not stop. According to Spencer, it acquires new, more advanced, and more efficient forms. It relocates into the sphere of the market. Here, the strongest survive, that is, the richest. Instead of the most powerful feudal lord, a hero, a strong person, or a leader, who simply seizes all that is up for grabs around his community, taking away all that belongs to other nations and races and sharing it with the ruling ethnicity or caste, now comes the capitalist, who brings the same aggressive animal principle to the market, the corporation, and the trading company. The transition from the order of power to the order of money according to Spencer, does not mean the humanization of the process, but only underscores greater effectiveness. That is to say, the struggle in the market sphere between the strong, meaning rich, and the weak, meaning poor, becomes more efficient and leads to higher levels of development until super-rich, super-strong, and super-developed countries appear. Progress, according to Spencer, and, more broadly speaking, according to liberalism, is always the growth of economic power. Since this continues to refine the struggle for survival of the animal species, the warfare methods of strong nations, and the castes within the framework of pre-capitalist states. Thus, an animalistic form of aggression is embedded in the liberal idea of progress, which is regarded as the main trajectory of social development. With more economic freedom, there is greater power for takeovers, attacks, mergers, and acquisitions. Liberal discourse, meaning the analysis of the liberal ideologist, is a completely animal discourse. In such a system, the more advanced law, or the more advanced, more modern methods of production do not mean that they are more humane. What it means is that they allow more opportunities for the strong to more effectively realize their power, while the weak can only admit defeat, or, if they have any strength left, fight on. In this manner, the modern idea of economic growth as we see in liberals such as Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke, has its foundation and origins in the idea of the struggle between species, that is, the feral destruction of the weak by the strong, and the validation of the strong at the expense of the weak. Only instead of the conflict between predators and herbivores, we have the golden billion, and in that golden billion, their own kings of beasts. The New York Stock Exchange and the World Bank Bankers, who devour all that is up for grabs and, at the same time, turn the forests of the world into quote-unquote social infrastructures. Therefore, when we speak of modernization in the liberal vein, 
Of necessity, we mean the enhancement of the social, political, cultural, spiritual, and informational scenario within which the absolute aggression of the strong against the weak can be implemented. American liberal Ayn Rand, Greenspan was one of her greatest admirers, created an entire philosophy called objectivism based on the following blunt idea. If one is rich, then he is good. She reached the limits of Weber's idea about the origin of capitalism in the Protestant ethic and said that he who is rich is always and necessarily the good. Almost a saint, while the poor man is evil, lazy, bad, and corrupt, a quote-unquote sinner. Being poor, according to Ayn Rand, is to be a sinful villain, whereas to be rich is to be a saint. She proposed to establish the, quote, conspiracy of the rich, meaning the strong, bright, sacred, and powerful capitalists against any kind of labor movement, the peasants, and against all those who stand for social justice and those who are simply poor. Such a crusade of the rich against the poor is the basis of the objectivist ideology. People like Greenspan and the current head of the United States Federal Reserve, Bernanke, are objectivists. That is, those who interpret modernization, progress, economic growth, and development in the liberal vein. If we understand modernization like liberal Democrats, then that means that we are invited to join in this terrible struggle for survival at its greatest intensity and to become just like them, trying to grab a place at the trough of globalization. Globalization, in this case, is the new battlefield in the struggle for survival, the struggle of the rich against the poor. Naturally, the ideologically, philosophic, and moral premise of this version of modernization is entirely alien to the Russian people in terms of our history and our culture. We reject this type of modernization unconditionally, and those who might try to impose it upon us will pay dearly for doing so. In communism, the idea of unidirectional progress is also present. Marx argued that changes in social structures, which lead to the improvement and development of societies and economies, will sooner or later result in the communist proletarian revolution, redistributing the accumulated wealth as a result of the development of alienating technologies. The expropriation of the expropriators will occur. Nevertheless, while this has not happened, Marxists say, let everything be as it may in the development of capitalism. Marx also saw history positively as advancement and viewed it as a tale of growth and improvement from the minus to the plus, from the simple to the complex. It is telling that the lion's share of the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels is devoted to criticizing specifically those anti-bourgeois political philosophies that derived from Marxism. First and foremost, those that are feudal, reactionary, and nationalistic. By doing so, Marx and Engels strove to emphasize that their communism was directed against the bourgeoisie in a manner different from the criticisms of the right-wing anti-capitalists. In reality, compared to all the other reactionary and conservative projects, Marxists stand on the side of the bourgeoisie and seek to bring its victory closer, since it translates into the narrative of historical progress and the logic of modernization. For this reason, Marxism rejects conservatism in all of its forms. The contradictions between the communists and the capitalists acquire a particularly acute character as the triumph of capitalism becomes irreversible and complete. It is here that the communists enter history as the vanguard of the proletariat and push historical progress further along towards socialism and communism. Once again, we see Darwinism in Marxism, including the full acceptance of evolutionary ideas and its belief in the miraculous power of scientific progress and technological improvement. We lived through this kind of modernization in the 20th century, paid for it more than in full. The people clearly do not have the slightest desire to repeat such experiments. Therefore, this version of modernization will not work, and moreover, no one speaks out in favor of it. Oddly enough, fascism, too, is an evolutionary movement. We may remember Friedrich Nietzsche, who spoke of the blonde beast and of the will to power that drives history. Nietzsche was an evolutionist and believed that, based on the logic and development of species, man will be replaced by the Superman, much like how man first came to replace the ape. He wrote, what is the ape to a human? A laughingstock or a painful embarrassment. And that is precisely what the human shall be to the overman, a laughingstock or a painful embarrassment. The National Socialists adapted a racial interpretation of this idea, that the white race is, quote, more developed than the black, yellow, or any other kind, and on this basis has the right to rule the world. Here we encounter the same progressivist outlook, 
along with the idea of development and improvement, all of which leads to the assumption of racial superiority on the grounds that the white nations own sophisticated instruments of industrial production, while other ethnic groups do not. Today we reject and criticize fascism for its racial component, but we forget that this ideology is also built on the idea of progress and evolution, just like the other two political theories of modernity. If we were to visualize the essence of Nazi ideology and the role of progress and evolution in it, then the connection between racism and evolution would become obvious to us. This connection, in a concealed form, can be seen in liberalism and even in communism. Even if not biological, we see cultural, technological, and economic racism in the ideology of the free market and in the dictatorship of the proletariat. In one way or another, all three ideologies originate from the same trend, the idea of growth, development, progress, evolution, and the constant cumulative improvement of society. They all view the world and the entire historical process as linear growth. They differ in their interpretation of this process, and they attribute different meanings to it, but they all accept the irreversibility of history and its progressive character. Thus, modernization is a concept that sends us back directly to the three classical political ideologies. Furthermore, we can see the common ground that unites the three ideologies throughout the idea of progress and in their positive evaluation of the concept of modernization. Nowadays, all three of these ideologies are being gradually discarded. This is strongly evident in regards to fascism and communism, but is somewhat less obvious with regards to liberalism. But even liberalism is gradually ceasing to satisfy the majority of the world's population and, simultaneously, is turning into something other than what it was during the quote-unquote classical era of modernity. Consequently, it is about time that we pose the question of searching for the fourth political theory beyond the first three. Additionally, the radical rejection of the three classical theories reflects our attitude towards what is common to them all. That is, our attitude towards modernization, progress, evolution, development, and growth. The American scientist Gregory Bateson, a theorist of ethnosociology, cybernetics, and ecology, as well as a psychoanalyst and linguist, described the monotonic process in his book, Mind and Nature. The monotonic process is the idea of constant growth, constant accumulation, development, steady progress, all accompanied by the increase of only one specific indicator. In mathematics, this is associated with the idea of the monotonic value. In other words, the ever-increasing value, hence monotonic functions. Monotonic processes are the type that will always proceed in only one direction. For example, all their indicators consistently increase without cyclical fluctuations and oscillations. Studying the monotonic process at three levels, at the level of biology, at the level of mechanics, steam engines, internal combustion engines, etc., and at the level of social phenomenon, Bateson concluded that when this process occurs in nature, it immediately destroys the species. If we are talking about an artificial device, it breaks down. If we mean a society, the society deteriorates and disappears. The monotonic process in biology is incompatible with life. It is an anti-biological phenomenon. Monotonic processes are completely absent from nature. All the processes which accumulate only one particular thing or emphasize only one particular trait result in death. Monotonic processes do not exist in any biological species, from cells to the most complex organisms. As soon as this kind of monotonic process begins, deviants, giants, dwarfs, and other freaks of nature appear. They are disabled, incompatible with life, cannot produce offspring, and life itself casts them out. Solving the problem of monotonic processes was one of the most important problems in the development of steam engines. It turns out that the most important design element in steam engines is the centrifugal governor. When a steam engine reaches cruising speed, it is necessary to regulate the intake of fuel, otherwise the monotonic process initiates, everything begins to resonate, and the speed of the engine can increase indefinitely, causing it to explode. It was precisely this solution of avoiding the monotonic process in mechanics that was the principal theoretical, mathematical, physical, and engineering problem during the early stage of industrialization. It turns out that the monotonic process is not only incompatible with life, but also with the proper functioning of a mechanical device. The task of designing a device must avoid the monotonic process, that is, it must prevent one-dimensional progress, evolution, development, and the placement of growth into a closed cycle. 
By analyzing sociology, Bateson showed that there are no monotonic processes in real societies. Monotonic processes, such as population growth, in most cases led to wars, which then reduced the population. In our society today, we see an unprecedented level of technological progress along with unbelievable moral degradation. If we look at all this evidence without the evolutionary bias, then we will realize that monotonic processes exist only in people's minds. In other words, they are purely ideological models. Bateson demonstrated that they do not exist in biological, mechanical, or social reality. Marcel Moss, a well-known French sociologist, criticized the monotonic process as well. In the book he co-authored, Sacrifice, Its Nature and Functions, and especially in his essay, The Gift, he showed that traditional societies paid great attention to the ritual destruction or sacrifice of surplus goods. The surplus was seen as excessive, lico, and usurious. Lico personifies evil. Usury is the interest charged on borrowed capital, and excess is that which is obtained beyond one's needs. For instance, surplus crops were seen as disastrous in traditional society. The ancient worldview was based on the belief that an increase in one area translates into a decrease in another. Therefore, a surplus had to be destroyed as soon as possible. For this purpose, the community either organized a feast, consuming all the additional food until they choked, or else gave it to the gods in the form of a sacrifice, gave it out to the needy, or destroyed it. This is the origin of a special ritual, the potluck, which brings about the deliberate gifting or destruction of excessive personal property. Marcel Moss proved that the belief in the destructiveness of monotonic processes lies at the foundations of human sociality. The society remained strong only through the rejection of the monotonic process and by turning growth into a cycle. Imile Durkheim, Peter M. Sorokin, and Georges Gervich, the greatest sociologists of the 20th century, in essence the classicists of sociological thought, argued that social progress does not exist. In contrast to the 19th century sociologists, such as Auguste Comte or Herbert Spencer, progress is not an objective social phenomenon, but rather an artificial concept, a kind of scientifically formulated myth. When we study societies, we can only speak of the different types thereof. There is no general criterion to determine which is more developed and which is less so. Lucien Lévy Brule attempted to prove that savages think pre-logically, while modern humans use logic. However, Claude Lévy Strauss demonstrated that savages think in the same way that we do, only their taxonomy is built differently. So they do not have less logic than we do, perhaps even more so, and they think in a more refined manner. As for the phases of social development, the greatest American cultural anthropologist, Franz Boas, and his followers, as well as Claude Lévi-Strauss and his school, prove that we cannot look at modern humans as being evolved from archaic and primitive tribes within the framework of anthropology. Primitives and primitive societies are simply different people and different societies. Modern humans are one group, and archaic humans another. But they are people, too, no worse than we are. They are not an underdeveloped version of us. They have different children who do not know myths and fairy tales, since they are not taught them, in contrast to our children. The adults are also different. Their adults do know the myths, whereas ours do not believe in them. Our adults, our sober and practical society, are more similar to their children. The adults in primitive tribes are capable of telling mythological stories, sincerely believe in them, and know that they embody the feats of their ancestors and their spirits in their own lives, making no distinction between them. In contrast, the children of primitive societies are characterized by cynicism, pragmatism, skepticism, and the desire to attribute everything to material causes. This does not mean that modern societies have grown from the state of primitivism and supersede it. It is just that we have configured our society differently, neither better or worse, and built it upon other foundations and other values. With regard to cultural studies and philosophy, Nikolai Denilevsky, Oswald Spingler, Carl Schmitt, Ernst Junger, Martin Heidegger, and Arnold Toynbee showed that all the processes in the history of philosophy and the history of culture are a cyclical phenomenon. The Russian historian Lev Gumilev also suggested this in his version of cyclical history, which he explained in his famous theory of passionarity. 
They all acknowledge that there is development, but that there is also decline. Those who place bets on there being only growth and development act against all norms of history, against all sociological laws, and against the logic of life. Such unidirectional modernization, such growth, such development, and such progress do not exist. Piotr Stampka, a contemporary Polish sociologist, stated that, in terms of how progress was viewed, there was a change in the humanities. In the 19th century, everyone believed that progress existed and that it was the principal axiom and a scientific criterion. But, if we examine the paradigms of the 20th century in the humanities and the natural sciences, there we will see that almost everyone rejected them. No one is guided by it any longer. Nowadays, the paradigm of progress is considered almost anti-scientific. It is incompatible with the criteria of contemporary science, just as it is incompatible with the criteria of humanism and tolerance. Any idea of progress is, in itself, a veiled or direct racism, asserting that, quote, our culture, for instance, the, quote, white culture or American culture, is of higher value than your culture, such as the culture of Africans, Muslims, Iraqis, or Afghans. As soon as we say that the American or the Russian culture is better than that of the Chukchi or the inhabitants of the Northern Caucasus, we act like racists. And this is incompatible with both science and with a basic respect towards different ethnicities. 20th century science uses cyclicality as a scientific criterion or, according to Stompka, we have moved from the paradigm of evolution, modernization, and development to the paradigm of crisis and catastrophes. This means that all processes in nature, society, and technology must be conceived as relative, reversible, and cyclical. This is the most important point. In terms of its methodological base, the fourth political theory must be rooted in the fundamental rejection of the monotonic process. That is to say, the fourth political theory must assert that the monotonic process is unscientific, inadequate, amoral, and untrue as its future axiom without specifying how the monotonic process must be rejected. And everything that appeals to the monotonic process and its variations, such as development, evolution, and modernization, should, at the very least, be understood in terms of the cyclical mode. Instead of the ideas of the monotonic process, progress, and modernization, we must endorse other slogans directed towards life, repetition, and preservation of that which is of value and changing that which should be changed. Instead of always looking for modernization and growth, we should instead orient ourselves in the direction of balance, adaptability, and harmony. Instead of desiring to move upward and forward, we must adapt to that which exists, to understand where we are, and to harmonize socio-political processes. And most important, Instead of growth, progress, and development, there is life. After all, there has been no proof offered yet to show that life is linked to growth. This was the myth of the 19th century. Life, in contrast, is connected to the eternal return. In the end, even Nietzsche incorporated his idea of the will to power into the concept of eternal return. The very logic of life to which Nietzsche was dedicated told him that if there is growth in life, the Apollonian movement towards the Logos, then the balance of the nocturnal Dionysian world exists as well. And Apollo is not just opposed to Dionysus, they complement each other. Half of the cycle constitutes modernization, while the other half decline. When one half faces up, the other half faces down. There is no life without death, being towards death, careful attention to death, to the flip side of the sphere of being as Heidegger wrote, is not a struggle with life, but rather its glorification and its foundation. We must put an end to antiquated political ideologies and theories. If we have truly rejected Marxism and fascism, then what remains is to reject liberalism. Liberalism is an equally outdated, cruel, misanthropic ideology like the two previous ones. The term liberalism should be equated with the terms fascism and communism, Liberalism is responsible for no fewer historical crimes than fascism, Auschwitz, and communism, the Gulag. It is responsible for slavery, the destruction of the Native Americans in the United States, for Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for the aggression in Serbia, Iraq, and Afghanistan, for the devastation and the economic exploitation of millions of people on the planet, and for the ignoble and cynical lies which whitewash this history. 
but most important, we must reject the base upon which these three ideologies stand, the monotonic process in all its forms, that is, evolution, growth, modernization, progress, development, and all that which seemed scientific in the 19th century, but was exposed as unscientific in the 20th century. We must also abandon the philosophy of development and propose the following slogan, life is more important than growth. Instead of the ideology of development, we must place our bets on the ideology of conservatism and conservation. However, we not only require conservatism in our daily lives, but also philosophical conservatism. We need the philosophy of conservatism, looking towards the future of the Russian political system. If it is going to be based on monotonic processes, then it is doomed to failure. No stability will ever come from a new round of unidirectional growth derived from energy prices, real estate, stocks, and so on, nor from the growth of global economy as a whole. If this illusion persists, then it may become fatal for our country. Today, we find ourselves in a transitional state. We know roughly what we are moving away from, but we do not know what we are moving towards. If we head towards that which directly or indirectly implies the belief in any monotonic process, then we will reach a dead end. The fourth political theory must take a step towards the formulation of a coherent critique of the monotonic process. It must develop an alternative model of a conservative future, a conservative tomorrow, based on the principles of vitality, roots, constants, and eternity. After all, as Arthur Muller van den Bruck once said, conservatism has eternity on its side.